All right, so we re I'm gonna try this one more time. Here we go. <laughs> what we're talking about is Odin's sacrifice of himself to himself. And when we're looking for a pattern of growth in any kind of thing, of the transitions from boy to man, we're looking for something. Why would this happen? Odin is the creator of, of the nine realms. He gave power over death of the nine realms to hell, the goddess hell, that very ancient personification of the being that greets you with the doorway to the burial mound. <laughs> I've never understood why he would he do that. But more importantly, I never really understood why Odin decided to hang on a tree. But it's all in the poetic and the prosetta. One of the things we've got to look at, it, first of all, is Yggdrasil. Most of the time, Yggdrasil talks that it is an ash tree, but it is not an ash tree. It is, by most academic accounts, it is, an, it is a U. And the, the trouble with the name came from an interpretation that was, that was um, difficult. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that goes with it, but Ig or uh, Yggdrasil means Ig's horse, Ig, the terrible one. It's an aspect of Odin. It's Odin's gallows steed. Now, the yew is one of those ancient trees that live for thousands of years, and they split off the trunks, and when you cut them, the sap and the resin is red, kind of a human idea to it. Um, but it also creates a toxin on hot summer days. It creates a toxin that if you sit underneath it and meditate, it will create a trance-like state. It will change your perception of things to say the least. So there's a shamanic aspect to it. When you take the two together, you come up with this idea that, well, he was really just meditating under a tree. That does us no good in today's world. All of that academic research doesn't help us understand what we're supposed to be doing when we're so separated from the world that we live in. All of these comforts that we enjoy, and I'm not going to sacrifice any of them, but they do create a set of blinders that, that, that say, why should I want to do that? Why should I want to emulate that? What would cause me to want to do something to make that transition to the next stage? Would it be peer pressure? That's not always going to do it. There's literally millions of 20-year-old men sitting around here playing video games that haven't made that transition to manhood. There's literally millions of 30-year-old men <laughs> who are in relationships who have not made that transition from the kind of warrior mindset to the husband-lover mindset, as we see Frey do when he moves Gerda. But back to Odin, there's some real interesting things as to why he went on this journey. And it starts in the have them all. Okay. After he's created everything, after it's all set in its place, in stanza six of the Voluspa, it says, Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones, and in council held. Names they gave to noon and twilight, morning they named, and the waning moon, night and evening, the years to number. They said about the construct of time there. And most of the ancient cities around the world, even some caves and landmarks are tied to this morning and evening and the moon and the solstices, how they measure time. It's a very important stanza and it hints at the idea that this might be much older than we think it is. <coughs> but they have sought their assembly seats, so they're all together. At Ithaval met the mighty gods, shrines and temples they timbered high, forges they set, they smithied ore, tongs they wrought, and tools they fashioned, the foundational implements of building a civilization, of building a community. The first thing they do is they met. These like-minded individuals got together. They built shrines and temples first. They timbered them high. Then they set forges and they smithied ore, tongs they wrought, and tools they fashioned. In their dwellings at peace, they played at tables. Of gold, no lack did the gods then know. So this is a good time. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody's got some idea to, to foster. There's no lack of the ability to develop oneself. It is a golden age. There is wealth and abundance. There is no lack. 
Till thither came up giants made three, huge of might out of Jotunheim. <coughs> and then it skips several stanzas. It goes into the naming of the dwarves and how they allocate everything. But don't forget those three giant mage that enter up because that's the reason Odin goes on this journey to become something. Even after he names the dwarves, after mankind has been given soul and sense, heat and motion and goodly hue, even the ash, the ash I know, Yggdrasil its name, with white, water white is the great tree wet, thence come the dews that fall in the dales. When you cut, like I say, when you cut a yew, its sap is red much like a human's. That blood sacrifice that renews the life of the tree. <coughs> Green by earth's well does it ever grow. And then it talks about, then come the maidens. After everything is set in place, then come the maidens. But we still have to remember those three powerful female Jotuns have entered Asgard's golden age. And things seem to be progressing. Then it comes to the war, I remember, the first in the world. When the gods with spears had smitten Goldveg, the lover of gold or gold drink, <laughs> and in the hall of poor had burned her. This is Odin's hall. Three times burned and three times born, oft and again, yet ever she lives. In this next stanza, stanza 22, Hyth they named her who sought their home, the wide-seeing witch in magic wise, minds she bewitched that were moved by her magic. To evil women, a joy she was. Those two stanzas have caused more confusion than, than almost as much as Loki has. Because people want to look at that and say, that's the reason the Vanir went to war, because they were being mean to this goddess of love and abundance and prosperity, Freya. It also lends itself, gives, gives these witchy women, these kind of Stevie Nicks dressed ladies, the idea that there's something edgy and cool and dangerous about their love. It helps build their ego. But Freya is nowhere mentioned in that. Not at all. Hyth is the, is the gold vague, is gold might. And Hyth is the, <laughs> is the shining one, the bewitching, the bewitching of men's minds by the love of gold. And they are two separate entities. They are two of the three all-powerful female Jotuns that enter Asgard during its golden age. Now, the third one is mentioned in the short Voluspa in the Ballad of Balder. There is a, in the short Voluspa, there's a, there's an entry where the third one is named, and her name is Horse Thief, Horse Thief. She is the horse thief. She is the antithesis of Awaz. She is the one that robs men of the ability to work together. So you have the love of gold. You have the bewitching of men's minds by that gold. And you have the inability to work together. It's not an uncommon condition amongst men of this day and age. We get out there, we work, we give 110%, we're breaking our back to make somebody else rich, we get a little bit of a paycheck, we invest a little, we save a little, we pay some bills, and yet always we watch on TV, we see the Kardashians and all these wealthy individuals and MTV cribs and all this, and we become bewitched by, I want this, I want that. We become bewitched by the love of gold and all of everything will be okay if I just had some money. And yet when you see these people that win the lottery, within a month to a year, they're broke. Came too easy, it goes too quick. And still they won't. For the rest of their lives, they'll be crippled by the knowledge that they failed when given everything they ever wanted. <laughs> but this is not Freya. The War of the Vanir, and here's where Odin proves that he is unfit to rule. On the host his spear did Odin hurl, then in the world did war come first. The wall that girdled the gods was broken and the field trod by the warlike wains. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones in council held, whether the gods should tribute, give, or to all alike should worship belong. So the, way, the reason why they show up is 
really never explained, but it's not the burning of these three all-powerful female Jotuns. Many people would like to assume that it is, but it's, it's nowhere stated in that. In fact, in the, in the Gilfanning, it says, <laughs> it says the same thing. It says three all-powerful female Jotuns entered Asgard. At, at that time, it's called the Age of Gold. Before it was spoiled by the coming of the women, even those who came out of Jotunheim. Next after this, the gods enthroned themselves on their seats and held judgment and called to mind whence the dwarves had quickened in the mold and underneath the earth, even as maggots do in the flesh. They name the dwarves, they give men their gifts, and then they go to war with their, with their counterparts, the Vanir. Now that war with the Vanir is important. But stanza 23 of the Voluspa, when Odin goes to war, he sits, he hurls his spear. Because all these other gods are saying, hey, wait a minute, shouldn't tribute be given to all alike? Should the gods tribute give or to all alike should worship belong? That's kind of a threat to his position, isn't it? That he might have to share this with other, other than with people that he's chosen? He's not dumb. He's crafty. He's intelligent. <laughs> but he also loses his throne. In his anger, in his arrogance, in his egotistical idea, when a threat to his position appears, he lashes out. He loses the war. And now he's got to go on a journey. And that journey is the next stage of growth for the husband and king to become for the husband to become the king. In the same way that Frey sacrifices that phallic symbol of the sword to the next generation of warrior to become that husband, so too must this builder and creator and ruler sacrifice something to become that sage and good king. And part of that is that mindset that says, I don't like it, I'm going to lash out at it. It is a threat to how I perceive myself and I'm going to destroy it. <coughs> and that is recorded in the Havamal. Stanza 139 of the Havamal, I ween that I hung on the windy tree, hung there for nights full nine. With the spear I was wounded, the very spear that he threw, and offered I was to Odin, myself to myself, on the tree that none may ever know what root runs beneath, what root beneath it runs. <laughs> so he's pierced by his own spear the very same spear that he hurled across the crowd because they were threatening his position, his perception of himself. His pride has been wounded. And many times when people find themselves with their wounded pride, they'll walk like people when they get divorced. I've talked to a lot of people when they got done with their divorce, they walked around like they had the word fool written right across their forehead. She was fooling around to me. He wasn't being faithful to me and they were doing this or they were doing that. And they were always wounded by their own pride because there was the perception that people are going to think that I wasn't man enough to keep my wife. People are going to think I wasn't woman enough to keep my husband. And here's a being who wasn't king enough to keep his kingdom. And he is wounded by the very spear that he threw. He's supposed to be there because he set it all up. All right? He's going to sacrifice an eye to gain this wisdom. He knows what's going to happen. He has memory and thought to feed upon the carcass of that dead ego. Let memory, the raven memory, feed on that carcass of the dead ego of the old self and devour it. Get rid of it, be done with it, to allow the raven of thought to fly high so we might achieve greater ideas and understand how far we might go. Our thoughts create our reality. And if our thoughts are continually focused on something that happened in our past because we can't get rid of it, we want to carry it around because that's our identity, we will never be allowed to allow that raven of thought to go where it needs to go for us to become what we need to become. 
Odin sets that example for us here. He pierces himself with the very spear that caused him to lose his throne, his pride, his ego, his overbloated perception of who he was, his idea that he was all powerful. He ran head first into a crowd of individuals that literally tore down the walls of Asgard and a new king was installed, sitting on the throne of something that he built. <laughs> that is a painful place to be. So for nine days and night, None made me happy with loaf or horn. You cannot console an individual that is dealing with a loss like that. Somebody, some other man is sleeping in my bed with my wife. Some other woman is sleeping in my bed with my husband. Some other dude got the promotion at work. Some other person is sitting in that chair that I've worked so hard for. Some other person, it's always, woe is me, I'm a victim. And no one can make you happy in that state of mind. It's very difficult to get a person to come out of their cups. And there below I looked. I took up the runes. Shrieking, I took them. And forthwith back I fell. So he's hanging in a tree. He looks below and he takes up the runes. How? How does he come off that tree? Does he mentally project the rope breaking and he falls free of the tree? Does he become physically lighter because his ego has been, has been destroyed? Has he killed some aspect of himself that allows him to come down off of that tree? There is that possibility. Once we begin to rid ourselves of the ruinous aspects of our personality and let that raven of memory devour that aspect of ourself that's holding us back. We might find, if we look below, that there is something there for us to use. In Odin's case, it is literally that time old, that old message that has passed through time and ages that gives men today the guidance to move through this world. Not as individual symbols of power, but as a laid out message of what life is going to look like. Let me explain. If you were the gods and you wanted men to understand what their life might look like, how would you do it? We have examples of all of these gods getting rid of aspects of themselves. But what would the rest of it look like? <laughs> If you're not going to interact with those that worship you on a daily basis, if the divine is not going to sit down on the couch and you're not going to sit there and have a beer with good buddy Thor, how are you supposed to know when we have diseases and wars, political ideologies that wipe out literally millions of men and women? When you have individuals sitting in the throne that cast the first spear and the walls of Asgard come down, how will you make sure that what you're doing is right and will go through to show men what, might, what they might expect and what they might learn. The runes are laid out pretty simply. The first at you have Fehu, Uruz, Thurisaz, Ansuz, Redho, Kinaz, Gift, Yebo, and Wunyo. So with that mobile wealth, I've got to have the primal strength to protect it. And I might count upon something from on high as Thor, the warder of men, and the wisdom of my ancestors to secure that future for this long journey of life. I might, in, I might look to the torch of inspiration my ancestors hold as a great gift to bring me joy. The second et shows what every man goes through. Hagalah is the radical destruction of what we have to deal with. Now these, it becomes a time of need and everything seems to be frozen. <laughs> and the harvest might be small, But the you, because there's no ash in the in the uh, in the uh, runes, but there's a you on that great tree. We might cast the lock cup, and if we happen to be lucky enough to bag an elk, 
and then we might enjoy success for our entire village under the sun. T was that rune of victory and success might give us new rebirth for if we work together, we might be, a, or be able to enjoy a higher state of being as men. We're all interconnected according to Lab Goose, and we might be able to develop that God seed. And when that happens, there'll be a new day and we'll be able to reclaim our ancestral homeland. That ancient message is literally what the runes say if you look at them in order. This is what Odin picked up when he shed that aspect of himself that he could free himself from that pier piercing. You know, you've got a spear piercing you to a tree. So something's got to give. You've got a, like a wounded animal biting off his arm in a trap or biting off his paw so he can be free of the trap. Same thing's kind of happening here. There's another aspect to it as well that, that might be considered. Because the next stanza says, Nine mighty songs I got from the son of Bolthorn, Bessalus' father. This is his uncle. And I drink a god of the goodly mead poured out from Othrir. Now, Bessla's uncle is, is most likely Mimir. Nine mighty songs I got from the son of, of Bolthorn, Mimir, Bessla's father, and a drink I got of the goodly mead poured out from Othrir. Then I began to thrive when wisdom gets. So once he sacrifices that aspect of himself that's holding him back, that's literally piercing him to that tree, that's keeping him from moving up or going down, it's holding him in place. And that's kind of the thing with the way a tree works. It pulls all those nutrients out of the ground that are solids and sugars and starches, and it moves up through the veins of the tree. And, the, and, and I forgot the name of the process, but each cell moves that water up through the tree till it comes out of the leaves. It mixes with the sunlight and gives off oxygen, takes in carbon dioxide. When people go through something in life, when they lose something that's very valuable to them in life, there's a real temptation to get stuck somewhere on that tree, just like Odin is. They will be stuck there. And if you look at a tree that's got some kind of blockage to the ability of these cells to move fluids, sugars, starches, whatever, up through the trunk of the tree, a great knot will form. And it'll be a blockage on the health of that tree. When people get stuck on something that happened in their life as their identity, and they get stuck on the tree, they become a great blockage. It no longer goes up to mix with the sunlight and produce those life-giving effects that we count on. So Odin figures all this out. There's also the possibility, these nine mighty songs, these ancestors are passed on. This is Kenaz. These are the all of our ancestors, all through, the, they all carry a torch of inspiration. They all carry a light. Our ability to see that light, that wisdom, that inspiration from our ancestors, we have to journey to another realm to do that. We can't just walk into the next room and talk to Grandpa. He's gone. Similarly, Odin can't just fall down off the tree, still be in the same place, and interact with all of these ancestors that have passed on and get this drink of goodly mead and nine mighty songs from his ancestors. They're in a different realm. Yggdrasil is that one location where you might traverse these realms in the same manner that Sleipnir allows him to traverse the realms. There's a gate to that realm, and it's guarded by a woman. And there's a queen of that realm. Her name is Hell. <laughs> For her to witness or view or interact with that, there's a passage. There's something that must happen. Now, there are a couple of schools of thought about that. I'm of both of them, really. One is that there was assistance to be able to view that other realm and hear these songs and see these torches once I picked up the runes and understand the course of life, once I have let go of those things that are sticking me in place in life, now I'm beginning to understand the keys of the universe. Now I'm beginning to be able to interact with these ancestors. Now I've got a healthy understanding of what this life might mean 
and what it might mean to go to the next one. It all flows together. That sacrifice of Odin of himself to himself was Odin getting rid of that ego that prevented him from being the effective king and sage that he needed to be to rule Asgard. Then I began to thrive and wisdom get. I grew and well I was. Each word led me on to another word, each deed to another deed. <laughs> and that's how it goes. That's how it goes through life. Then I began to thrive. After I get rid of those things that are sticking me in place on the tree, after I begin to understand this healthy interaction with my ancestors, after I begin to make my, get rid of those hindrances that are keeping me from obtaining that wisdom of Ansu's from my ancestors who have passed on, that means I've gotten out of my own way. That means my ego is not telling me, well, you can't do that. Why do you want to do that? Nobody else is doing that. Who do you think you are to do that? You can't understand that. Who are you? Well, once you get rid of that and every thought isn't centered around how great someone else is going to perceive you if you say this or if you say that or if you act that way or if you look this way, you're no longer stuck in place by the opinions of everyone else. That allows you to put a focus on your ancestors. That allows you to be able to see that message encoded in the runes that's passed through times, what they mean as a whole, what they mean individually, how they are a language of writing, how they are magically and spiritually. Once you get rid of that, as Odin gives us that very powerful example, he suffered a loss. And instead of letting it stick and just being a wanderer from here on out, <coughs> he went and decided to do something about it. Then he began to thrive and wisdom get. I grew and well I was. Each word led me on to another word, each deed to another deed. And each one of them was better than the last. Each one of them moves him up the trunk of Yggdrasil back to Asgard. Our life is much the same way. Each action, each thought, each word, our thoughts create our reality. And if we're constantly thinking about thoughts that move us up and forward, we're going to move up and forward. If we're constantly thinking about thoughts that drag us into the past so we remember some embarrassing situation or how we wronged this or how we did this wrong or how we failed here, that's where we stay. If we're constantly looking for someone else to blame for the situation that we're in, some other political idea, some other group of people, some other this or some other that, or something out there is stopping me from becoming what I'm supposed to become, that's where you're going to stay. You've got to feed that raven of your memory. You've got to feed it with them old things. Because you're going to be stuck right where you are if you can't figure out that none of that out there is hindering you from becoming what you're supposed to become. Only us. It's our thought process. And we're the ones that control it. It's your mind. It's in the, your head. And every day we give away the ability to control our own thoughts to something out there, something out there. And now you've been red pilled or black pilled and you really know the truth. <clears throat> okay. How are you going to use that? Is that going to put food on your table? Is that going to help you pay a bill? Is that going to help you love your children any better? Yes, you might know to go left or go right, but for the most part, all I've ever seen those kinds of thought processes do is stick a person right in place on that tree of life, that tree of Yggdrasil, and that's where they stay. Odin tells us real clearly I had to get rid of a part of myself so I could pick up the runes, and it was painful. I shrieked when I did it, and I fell down. Nine mighty songs I got from my ancestors and a drink of the goodly meat. So his ancestors were there to help him pick him back up. Songs of healing, like the Mirrorsburg charms. Songs of love and inspiration. Songs of support. And they gave him a drink of mead after nine days of no one there to help him. And more often than not, when you are stuck in that situation, if you stay there long enough, you will also find that you are alone. There are men sitting in prison right now that have been there for 12, 15, 20, 30 years. No one comes to visit them. 
No one puts money on their books. They are there all alone. And they will die there. And the crazy thing is, is there's people in this world who are also all alone, surrounded by society. And yet they let the thought of the news or the thoughts of what they read in the newspaper form their ideas so that anytime you come around them, I just, you just don't even want to be around them. They're negative, they're hateful, they're spiteful. And you know what? They live alone. And it's a sad thing to see. Some people, obviously, there are a lot of reasons for it, but there's a man not far from me who's a perfectly healthy individual, but he absolutely refuses to shed those things that are hindering him from becoming more than what he is. They are his identity. He has no idea what will happen to him if he gives up all of that hate and anger and resentment about everything he thinks might be affecting him. He has thoroughly bought into the lies, the fears, the manipulation that other men use to control other men. It forms the very basis of who he thinks he is. He will not find, he is afraid to take that action that's going to cause him pain so he might find those runes or hear those nine mighty songs. He has no idea what it will look like to thrive or to wisdom get. He has no idea what it means to grow and to be well. He has no idea what word leads to another word, what deed leads to another deed. And that right there reminds me that even after I've sacrificed that idea of myself that's sticking me in place, I, uh, I still have to do some work. I still got to speak good things. I still have to give wise and good counsel. Now I have an obligation to share it my deeds lead to another deed. And they may not all be great. Some of them might just be mowing the neighbor's lawn. Runes that shalt thou find in faithful signs that the king of singers colored and the mighty gods have made. So after we do that, after we sacrifice that, we're going to find the runes and faithful signs. We're going to be in a place after we've sacrificed this aspect of ourself that's sticking us in place, after we get rid of this ego that tells us we don't have one or that tells us, oh, you're a little bit more important than that guy. You're blah, blah, blah. Not based on confidence, not based on any kind of word or deed, but on some idea that you can pair it because you read it from some 19th century idea or book or some other buddy. Excuse me. <laughs> once you get out of your own way, once you set that ego aside about how great you think you are, once you quit playing the victim, runes will you find and faithful signs that the king of singers colored and the mighty gods have made. Full strong the signs, not no half measures, but the full power of the blessing of the divine, full mighty signs that the ruler of gods does right. Odin for the gods, Dane for the elves, and Dvalin for the dwarves, Alvis for giants, and all mankind, and some myself I wrote. Dane and Dvalin, they say here, are identified as dwarves. Dane, however, is one of the elves rather than the dwarf. And the, other, the names also appear together in the Grimness Mall where they are applied to two of the four hearts that nibble at the topmost twigs of Yggdrasil. Alsvith, the All's Wives, All Wise, appears nowhere else as a giant's name. So there's more than one way to read that. Each leader of each race has the opportunity to write these full strong signs, full mighty signs that the ruler of the gods writes. Odin writes them for the gods, Dane for the elves, Dvalin for the dwarves, Allsvith for the giants and all mankind. Why is a giant writing these runes for mankind? Because we have to grow. All of the gods come from some kind of Jotun stock. All of the gods, in every case, every story, there is some episode where they have to do the same thing that Odin does, 
not to the same dramatic effect, but they have to separate themselves from those thoughts. It might be how they were raised, as is in the case of Tyr. It might be Freya learning to raise two beautiful daughters without the support of a man. This was a common occurrence in the old time. They would go off to war and never come back. The woman still has to carry forward and raise these children. Beautiful children. <laughs> it might be Thor learning how to deal with magic and protect mankind to be the warder of men willing to make that sacrifice as Tyr is willing to make the sacrifice for the safety of his kindred. For Odin, once he learned how to get out of this way, and learned that worship could belong to all, and it doesn't change anything about who he is. An exchange is made. Now he, through the course of action, gets everything back that he gives to the gives to the to the Vanir. He gets Mimir's head back, right? So he's got access to all of that wisdom and knowledge he sacrifices an eye for. But he also gets Niord a god of the sea, and his son and daughter, Frey and Freya. So these high-minded aspects of the sky gods begin to interact with these powerful, motivating forces of life. Laguz is the omnipresent substance that connects every living thing. And Frey and Freya are the powerful aspects of abundance, fertility, um, the gentle rain and sunshine that invigorate that substance with spirituality. So now these high-minded gods have a pathway with which to connect with mankind through that presence of water, Lagoos. <laughs> There's a lot to consider in this Odin's sacrifice of himself to himself. There are a lot of beautiful things that we might consider. There is no promise that it will not be painful. There's no promise that it will not hurt to, to take an honest look at ourselves and say, this thought process has been causing me pain for a long time. This resentment, this pain, this bad feeling, this regret that I have over causing a good man or a good woman or a child or a parent harm is something it's time for me to let go of so I can learn these words that lead to another word and act on these deeds that lead to another deed and start to live life, to move on up the trunk and interact with the sun, to feel the presence of Laguz and that spirituality and that abundance and the prosperity that seems to me comes from that sacrifice of those things that are holding us back. And it's a painful process to realize that all of these things we've been thinking, all of these things which make us smarter than the next guy, all of these passions that allow us to dislike this or dislike that or know the real truth are not moving us forward. It's time to let some of them go and let that raven of memory feast upon the carcass of those old thought processes so that the raven of thought might fly high and show us new heights. This is what I find gives me the most reassurance that what I'm doing is on the right path and I can pick up some of the runes and look at them and see what's going on, see where I've been, see what I've done. And then I don't have to carry around all that bucket of garbage that I carried around for such a long damn time that I thought made me who I was. This deed or that deed, well, that's not who I am. None of it changed the color of my hair. None of it changed the color of my eyes or the color of my skin and all of it fooled with my emotions and my thought process so that I may or may not have been someone worth being around, someone worth looking up to, someone worth loving. Sometimes we've got to get rid of that stuff because it pins us in place on the tree. And there may not always be a goddess to cut you down from that tree so you can 
interact with the wisdom of your ancestors or hear those runes. It might hurt, but there's a promise in all of that that says life gets much better. When we begin to make that sacrifice for the betterment of our community and work as a team of men, we might begin to understand how we're all connected together as a folk through Lagoos, how we might begin to develop the ing, that God, that, that seed of the divine which resides within all of us, so we can enjoy a new day, reclaim our homeland or build a new one or claim our ancestral heritage. That's the last et of the, of the runes. It's all there right in front of us. We're not going to see it until we get rid of some of those things that are sticking us in place. It's kind of my take on the sacrifice of Odin to him, of himself to himself. I think I'm right. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> because I know that if you follow it like that and you look at it that way and you make that sacrifice of yourself to yourself to get rid of that ego, you're going to get to enjoy a good, good life. I appreciate your time tonight, guys. Thank you very much.